here right on my desktop. Now this this is not Spanish or Portuguese, but this is this is the New Testament in the William Tyndale version. Old Tyndale did a translation into English. He got the New Testament done. He got a little bit of the Old Testament, but then they burned him on the stake for for doing that. Um, <clears throat> but it's all in the original spelling and everything of the day. Much of the King James Version was based on Tyndale's translation. So if you read Tyndale, then you'll see, see it uh, repeated in a considerable degree in the, in the King James Version. Do you mind if we start, guys? It's 7 or 2. Um, yes. We are live on YouTube, and I will be recording it for those who are unable to join us today. Uh, one second. And Mohammed, just a quick question. I have the uh, power to share my desktop, right? To show the slides. Uh, yes. As a co-host, you are able to share your screen. Uh, if not, just let me know, and I will change the setting immediately. Okay, yes, I do see that. Okay. okay. Good evening, dear guests. Uh, my name is Mohammed Ali Cesar, and I'm the Executive Director of Dialogue Institute, Oklahoma. I'm so delighted to welcome you to our program. Uh, tonight's program will be the third in our new program series on restoration, uh, reconciliation, and resiliency. And as far as I know, uh, we have guests not, not just all around the United States, but also from abroad. Our reputation has reached many countries. Um, just one example is, uh, is our friend from Pakistan, Hazik. Um, I think he's, he's, he might be like, you know, with us uh, at the moment, but regardless of the time difference between here and Pakistan, um, Hazik and many people like Hazik support us. Um, so now what I want to do is to thank our distinguished speakers Reis Huyan and our wonderful moderator, uh, Dr. Raju Rendell. Our speaker and moderators have made time available for this program out of the, their busy schedule. And therefore, um, I would ask you to give a big virtual round of applause to express our gratitude. Um, just, you know, whatever you can uh, to the show your express, you know, express uh, gratitude, please do so. So we appreciate your interest in our program. Uh, thank you each and every single one of you for being here. It is always a joy to have you with us. So um, I will briefly talk about Dialogue Institute, Oklahoma, for our, for our new friends. Um, we are devoted to promoting mutual understanding, respect, and cooperation among people of diverse faiths and cultures by creating opportunities for direct communication and meaningful shared experiences. Our goal is to build reliable relationship in order to collaborate on substantial programs and services that contributed to benefit of our society and help promote social cohesion. Our work emphasizes diversity, greater interfaith and cross-cultural understanding and respect. Getting to know others through our events and programs can be the first step for many people who do not have the opportunity to interact with the people of other faiths or backgrounds. So this free event is made possible by the Dialogue Institute Oklahoma and our sister organization, Dialogue Institute Dallas. I was so fortunate to work with my dear friend Hussein on this event. It was delightful to partner with the Dialogue Institute Dallas. So we look forward to further collaboration. I think our collaboration is a great sign of the good relationship we are building between Oklahomans and Texans. Um, so even though we have disagreements about football, we still like each other. We love our friends from Texas and we love to do more together. Um, anyway, um, I don't wanna take too much time uh, from tonight's event and I will pass it over to Hussein. Hussein, the podium is yours. Thanks again for all your help on this event. Well, thank you, Mohammed. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, thank you Dr. Randall and Race for this wonderful gathering. 
Uh, I would echo what you, you said over two decades uh, at the Dialogue Institute Southwest, we have been working uh, to promote dialogue and understanding and uh, try to create platforms to have meaningful uh, friendships and engagements. Um, uh, yesterday, we had a program about racial reconciliation with another partner. And uh, through this Zoom uh, era, I'm, I'm glad that we are able to connect uh, further our borders. It is wonderful uh, to connect uh, these mean, me, means. Uh, race, I heard him a few times actually here uh, in Dallas. It is wonderful to share your story uh, through now beyond Dallas. I'm hearing some people are joining us from uh, from India, from different parts of the world too. Uh, and uh, uh, these connections make dialogue more and more meaningful for sure. And without further ado, actually, I want to uh, invite uh, another friend of Dialogue Institute of Oklahoma and uh, Dallas to introduce our moderator, Dr. Randall uh, Kamil. Thank, thank you, Hussein. Uh, good evening, everybody. Good evening, Dr. Randall. It's been a while that I haven't seen hey, you. Uh, definitely good to see you again. Uh, now I am uh, obviously in Dallas and uh, volunteering, this, doing the same thing for uh, that I did in Tulsa. I used to lead the uh, Tulsa branch of Dialogue Institute, and my replacement had to be a Muhammad Ali. Uh, no, uh, they, they, they picked the right, right person to replace me. Uh, so it's been um, about more than uh, nearly 10 years that I, I moved to Dallas. And um, uh, Dr. Randall and I, actually, we had the opportunity to visit Turkey back in 2007 when Turkey was a more reasonable country uh, back then. Uh, but now it's a little, a little challenging uh, to um, even think about, think about or talk about the country. Uh, but yes, we had a very good time and uh, we were discussing some of the... Um, uh, uh, some of the specialties that Dr. Randall had, right? So he knows Portuguese, he speaks Spanish, and I'm not sure if anybody knew that he's a great photographer. Uh, throughout the trip, he took so many pictures and uh, so many wonderful pictures. And when we came back, actually we did a few showings uh, of those during our annual dinners uh, in Tulsa in our cultural center. Uh, and he did a fantastic job to actually promote uh, his experiences uh, when he came back. Uh, plus, we were able to visit with some uh, government officials back in Turkey at the time, trying to establish some bridges uh, between uh, Tulsa, uh, Tulsa and Turkey. And we are definitely grateful uh, for you, Dr. Randall. Definitely, it was a pleasure to get to know you better. And also, uh, thank you so much for everything you have done for our organization and also our ambition to create a better world. And I would like to just um, uh, briefly um, uh, read your uh, memo. I'm not sure if you need a lot of uh, introduction, but uh, for, uh, for reference, for, for people to, to get to know you better, uh, just, just a brief intro of you. Uh, Dr. Randall is a graduate of University of Oklahoma. Uh, this, this part a little hurts, but it's okay. I, I am a Cowboys, I'm a Oklahoma, I went to Oklahoma State, but we, we like each other. We are all Oklahomans, right? And he has a law degree from the University of Tulsa. Uh, in 1970, at the age of 27, I'm sorry we had to give your age out, uh, but this is the bio that I, I received. Uh, he was elected to Oklahoma House of Representatives. He was elected to the Oklahoma Senate in 1972, uh, then re-elected in 1976, 1980, and in, in 1984. In 1988, he became mayor of the city of Tulsa and led the successful campaign to change the city's form of government. He was re-elected in 1990 by the largest margin in Tulsa's history, becoming Tulsa's first mayor under the new mayor city council form of government. In 1992, he left the office of mayor to accept an appointment as president of the University of Center in Tulsa, which later became Rogers University. He teaches an office in Tulsa, and he also holds the title of professor and director of the Center for Studies in Democracy and Culture. A lot of hard work to develop the city of Tulsa. I work for a company called Hilti, and Dr. Randall was one of the delegates actually from Tulsa to go to Liechtenstein to meet with the Hilti family to convince them to move to Tulsa. And that was a big success. Uh, definitely, I loved every bit of the city when I lived there. I still consider Tulsa as my home uh, as a Turk who moved to the United States later on. And Dr. Randall, thank you so much for everything you did and the stage is yours. Thank you, Kamal. Uh, I had the honor of introducing our guest of honor, Reis Bouillon. And I suspect that folks have read the biography, but I just want to uh, 
emphasize some highlights about race's background. First of all, he is and probably is the first to appear on one of the dialogue programs, um, an Air Force pilot. And <clears throat> but he gave up that career in the Air Force to come to the United States uh, in 1999 to, dis to study uh, computer technology. Uh, so all was going well. And then we had 9-11. We had the emotional reactions to uh, that event on the part of many Americans. And one of the expressions of those emotional reactions was an attack on race and some other folks that he was with. Race was shot in the face. He, he survived. The others uh, did not. But we can all imagine if something like that happened to us the, the, in remembering that, that race almost died as a result of those injuries, but that, but that experience um, led him to a lot of rethinking about what's important in life and about society and how, how people get along and, and <clears throat> reacting to the fact that that attack was based on indiscriminate hate against a a, a class of people, a group of people. Um, race used that opportunity to reimagine where we could be in the world, what kind of world we, 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 we could become a part of. And so following his recovery, he started devoting his life in part to sharing a message of the importance of, of human understanding and, and, and not just acceptance, but appreciation of all the different kinds of people that, that we are that make up, make up society. And so as an activist for peace and for forgiveness and empathy and understanding and all those kinds of things that, that began to motivate a central part of race's life. He, he began a nonprofit called World Without Hate. And the work of race and his non nonprofit has become widely recognized. And you can read all the details of the awards that he's received and, and the honors that he's had, and the book that was written about him in the book, The True American Murder and Mercy in Texas. Uh, you can see his story on TV and in print, and he was invited to work with the Obama administration. So his, his recognition for his efforts have been very broad. He still keeps his job as an IT technician and I suspect race as a former pilot, if you're like most of them, you still wish you could be up in that plane, uh, but you devote your life to your, your profession and you devote it to, to your work. You travel globally on, uh, on behalf of the nonprofit. You're officially recognized by the State Department on their um, uh, official speakers list. So those are just, some summaries of some important things about race. <clears throat> but I want to observe before I turn the program over to race that we're honored to have him. We're going to learn things from him. But the importance of race's participation here is because of all of you who are tuned in and, and participating in this event, because it is through your commitment to the values you share, we all share with race in the message of, of, of building understanding in the world that we are here. And so I know that we're gonna leave this program tonight more inspired, more understanding about uh, our own potential to do what, what race has done to spread this message in our own communities. 
So it's now my honor to turn the program over to Ray Spuyan and, and to say welcome to Oklahoma and Texas and welcome to the world because the world is represented among the audience today. Well, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Rendell, for your kind interaction. And a special thanks to everyone at the Dialogue Institute uh, for organizing this special event. I'm truly honored to be here with you today. So before I um, share my story, I would like to uh, share my screen first so that I can uh, show some of the PowerPoint slides. Okay, uh, do you all see my screen? Yes. Perfect, okay. Where are you from? Not a typical question to ask during an armed robbery. 10 days after 9-11 terrorist attacks, when rescuers continue to search ground zero for signs of lives, our country in deep mourning, a newfound fear and uncertainty looming. I begin what would be my last day of work as a store clerk in Southeast Dallas. Around noon, a man walked in wearing bandana, sunglasses, and a baseball cap, pointing a double barrel shot, pointing a, a double barrel shotgun straight at my face. Having been robbed before, I immediately opened the cash register and offered him money. The cash I placed on the counter in exchange for my life remained untouched. His gaze remained fixed. I felt a cold air flow through my spine. He then asked me, where are you from? Despite pleading for my life, he pulled the trigger from point blank range. First, I felt it, like a million bees were stinging my face, and then I heard it, the explosion. I looked down and saw blood pouring like an open faucet from the right side of my head. Frantically and instinctively, I placed both hands on my face thinking I had to keep my brain from spilling out. Then I noticed the gunman still standing there. I fell to the floor. He finally left. I found myself in my own pool of blood, fighting to stay awake, fighting to stay alive. On the way to the hospital, I began losing consciousness. Images of my family and my fiance appeared before my eyes. And then a graveyard. I promised God that if he let me live, I would do good things with my life. Five hours after I was shot, I finally lost consciousness and was put on life support. The next thing I remember asking, where am I? Thinking I had died, I anxiously waited. And when I heard, good morning, Mr. Bhuyan, you're in the hospital. It was one of my, well, it was one of the most beautiful moments of my life. My eyes were full of tears, not from the pain, but from the joy of still being alive but the joy didn't last long. Within a few hours, the hospital, which was private and expensive, and I did not have health insurance at that time, discharged me 
and told me to arrange follow-up medical treatments on my own. My American dream turned into an American nightmare. As a result of the shooting, I underwent several eye surgeries. Unfortunately though, I ended up losing sight in one eye. The right side of my face and skull was and remains peppered with more than three dozen shotgun pellets. I lost my job, my sense of security, my home, and my fiance, but gained more than $60,000 in medical bills. I reached out to the Red Cross, but they informed me I was only qualified for one week's worth of groceries. Over the last few years, I have undergone additional surgeries and continue to contend with various health issues related to the shooting. There is not a single day that goes by that I'm not reminded of or affected by this painful tragedy, but I continue to make peace with my pain. A shooter, Mark Stroman, killed two South Asian men during his 9-11 retaliation shooting spree. Stroman claimed he was hunting Arabs, but not one of his victims was Middle Eastern. After his arrest, he told the news media that he had done what most Americans wanted to do. They just didn't have the guts. He claimed that he was the true American, a patriot. He blamed me and my kind for 9-11. And he said, America was no place for Muslims. Mark was tried and convicted. In 2002, he was sentenced to death by lethal injection. Over the next several years, I went through an intense healing process, physically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally. In such traumatic, critical moments in life, I don't think we can blame anyone for giving up or finding temporary relief in the wrong places. I had the choice, but ultimately I could not let myself down. My dreams were bigger than my fears. My faith was much stronger than any of my mental, emotional, and physical weaknesses. I prayed and begged God for mercy, asking for the strength to face this adversity without losing myself and to help rebuild my life. Many obstacles were thrown along the way. For example, I realized that I had developed a fear of large, bald-headed white men with tattoos, just like my attacker. When I, and I did not want to venture out in public, but then isolation set in. When I did leave the house, I kept looking over my shoulder to see if anyone was about, who, if anyone was going to finish the job. All of this made me realize that merely praying was not going to solve the trauma I was contending with. I slowly began to rebuild my life, attending school and becoming a waiter to improve my people's skills, overcoming my fears, and to learn to talk Texan. Like y'all, come back and see us and try our Texas Asti to bond with the locals. I transformed myself from an airman to stole clerk to waiter to survive. I'm not here simply because I survived, but because after hitting rock bottom in a foreign country, I used the bottom as a foundation to learn and grow. As unbelievable as this may sound, I gained more from these experiences that I lost. I lost a great deal, but did not lose my hope, 
my dreams and my faith. I would not and did not give up. In school, I learned that if I ever fall, I should get right back up and try again. Giving up was not an option for me. I never questioned God about why all these bad things happened to me. I had no doubt that he was preparing me for something bigger in the future. And these helped me to see myself as a survivor, not simply a victim. I remember my parents sharing a verse from the Holy Quran, chapter two, verse 286, quote, God will never place a burden on a soul that it cannot bear. End quote. Human beings can tolerate many unthinkable burdens, even when initially they feel they can take it anymore, yet they live through it. I went through great difficulties, but I made it and become stronger each and every day. I remember another verse from the Holy Quran, chapter 94, verse 5 and 6. Quote, so verily, with every difficulty, there is relief. Verily, with every difficulty, there is relief. And slowly, relief came. An acquaintance took me in, so I had a place to stay. A Christian doctor performed eye surgeries before receiving assurance he would be paid. An Air Force veteran gave me his extra car. A man from the local mosque gave me a scholarship to attend school. And because of that education, I was able to get a good IT job. This is the America. Generous, hospitable, warm, welcoming. That I heard so much about growing up. With the mercy of God and the help of many kind, caring Americans, I was eventually able to get my life back on track. And in 2009, I was extremely fortunate to go on a religious pilgrimage along with my mother. Though I had forgiven Mark long ago, it wasn't until I was in Mecca that I began reflecting back on my shooting and would be killer sitting on death row waiting to die. I deeply felt by executing Mark, we would simply lose a human life without dealing with the root cause. Instead of hating him, I began to see him as a human being like me, not just a killer. I saw him as a victim too. I credit my faith and my upbringing in giving me the courage and strength not only to forgive him publicly, but also to fight to save the life of the man who tried to end mine returned to the US. And with the support of Amnesty International, I began lobbying to save the life of my attacker. Working with Reprieve, a London-based nonprofit, we took the campaign to the European Union and German parliaments, as well as the headquarter of Lundbeck, the lethal injection manufacturer in Denmark. We convinced them to urge the government of Texas not to use their product to kill. After our visit, Lundbeck announced they would stop supplying this drug to the prisons in the U.S. carrying out executions. We also petitioned the U.S. Supreme Court asking for clemency for my attacker. In the meantime, Mark came to know about me and the diverse coalition of Christians, Hindus, Jews, Muslims, atheists, and all who rallied together to get him removed from death row. I was told he was stunned and deeply touched by our efforts. This was not something he expected from a Muslim. He wrote a long letter to me from death row. Allow me to read a few lines. He said, my stepfather taught me some lessons that I should have never learned. It has taken me for too long to unlearn some of them and I'm still working on some of them. I don't know who your parents were, but it is obvious they're wonderful people to lead you to act this way 
to someone you have every right to hate. He thanked the entire Muslim community, condemned his own acts of violence, and called me brother in a phone conversation. In another statement, he said, at the time, there in America, everybody was saying, let's get them. We didn't know who to get. We were just stereotyping. I stereotyped all Muslims as terrorists, and that was wrong. Killing another human being is not something you can forget and go. Here is Mark himself sharing his thoughts during our campaign. Well, matter of fact, this is a <clears throat> This is a copy of the letter he, he wrote to me. For this man to forgive me, which I've done unforgivable for him to come forward the way he did, it speaks volume. It speaks volume for the human race. Ah, uh, Mr. Reyes, thank you for your, your inspiring act of love, compassion towards me. You have forgiven me. You have forgiven the unforgivable. And I have a lot of love and respect for you. For the Patels, the Hassans, thank y'all for what y'all have done. Uh, your, the question is, if I don't make it, what do I want you to carry on? Man, just what you're doing today is, is remarkable. To, you know, to, to get out there and take center stage and try to get the world, put the world to rights. You know, that's, that's a remarkable thing you're doing. And just continue with the human rights movement because you are touching so many people. I've been getting so many, so many letters and messages from all over the world that you, Mr. Reyes, are inspiring them. And that right there strengthens me. So, dude, just rock on. Thank you for giving me. It moves me profoundly to think that the man who tried to kill me because of the ways in which I was different, learned to see the ways in which we were the same enough to call me brother. He hated me when he didn't know me, but in the end said he loved me. It seems to me that although retaliation is a natural response, it does not make you feel as good as you think it will. Any harm you inflict or hope to see inflicted against another human being winds up hurting you too. Once you get to know the other, it is hard for you to hate them. Before he was executed, his last words were, hate is going on everywhere. It has to stop. Hate causes a lifetime of pain. Empathy and forgiveness had a transformative effect on Mark. People can change and grow given the opportunity and the chance. Difficulties can turn into blessings, obstacles into opportunities. No matter how challenged our life is today, there is a hope for a better tomorrow. Being resilient and seeking reconciliation does not mean that you are or have to be superhuman. That you don't or won't feel pain, stress or sadness, or even at times that you won't just want to give up. Resilience for me is a journey to discover and redefine ourselves by our inner strength, strength that we are often unaware we have until we are faced with the great difficulties. My journey has helped me and inspired many to be more compassionate and empathetic to all those going through challenges each and every single day. Look within yourself, you too, have this very strength. The challenges we all face give us the opportunity to bring out the best in us. We are all capable 
of turning negatives into positives, weaknesses into strength, despair into hope, ignorance into wisdom, fear into courage, and hate into love, restoring peace for ourselves and others. And this, I believe, is how we can truly realize a world without violence, a world without victims, and a world without hate. Thank you. Thanks very much, Race. That 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 was that was wonderfully told, and uh, I think inspirational to all of us. We've invited everyone to prepare questions and to submit them, uh, but I'd like to take advantage of the opportunity of the fact that I'm the one who's the moderator here to ask the first questions. So <clears throat> my first question is, when we think about your attacker, as you have pointed out, he was a victim too. He was a victim of the fate, of the hate that consumed him. Where, where do people get that kind of hate? How, 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 could, how could hate, and we have to say ignorance because it was poorly directed hate, you had nothing to do with what uh, events he was upset about. How does hate take over people in that way, Race? Well, that's a very good question. Um, I believe there are three places where you learn from. The first one is our family. Second one is our educational institution. And the third one is our correctional facilities. And in Mark's case, all three institutions failed him. As I mentioned in, in his letter that his stepfather taught him a lot of negative lessons that he should not have never learned. So the first institution, the family failed him. And uh, he never felt loved. He grew up with lots of negative teachings, a lot of uh, negligency, and no guidance, no role model, lack of education. And then when he went, he entered the next institution, educational institution, that system also failed him. He was a dropout. He had his first parole officer at the age of 12 where he had his, uh, this life full of crime for the for next 20 years, but that started when he was 12 years old. And he was in and out now and then. So that the correctional facility system also failed him. It did not give him any chance, any opportunity to rehabilitate. So he built up his life full of crimes and um, lack of guidance, lack of role model. And I remember in one statement, he mentioned that also when he was 16, when he turned 16, he wanted to get his driver's license and he asked his mother to give his birth certificate. And he saw someone's name, which did not uh, look like his father's name. It was, a, it, 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 uh, it was a different person's name. So he asked his mother, who is this guy? And his mother said, that's your actual father. And then who is this person? He's not your real, real father. Why didn't you tell me all this? His mother answered that, I even didn't want you. If I had $50, I would have aborted you. And you can imagine that hearing something like this from your own mother, what went through in his mind as, 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 as a teenager. So he grew up with a lot, you know, uh, less uh, self-esteem, self-respect. And um, when 9-11 happened, he was glued to the TV. He was watching all the news clips running 24 seven, the planes hitting the Twin Tower. He kept listing our public officials and our leaders blaming all Muslims for 9-11. And he said he snapped. 
he could not take it anymore. He felt he had the responsibility to take revenge against those immigrants, those foreigners, those Muslims who are responsible for 9-11. And he said, I couldn't sit there anymore. I snapped, took up arms, and wanted to give a lesson to the foreigners, to the immigrants. So back to your point that where his hate came from, a, a traumatic childhood, lack of love, lack of guidance, lack of respect, lack of purpose of life, and then in and out in the, um, in the, uh, in the criminal uh, legal system. And um, he was inspired by some of our leaders and by the media that blamed Muslims for 9-11. So he, he was a person who had become filled with anger about lots of things. And then 9-11 focused that anger into hate that looked for an expression. And unfortunately, you were there when he had the double barrel shotgun and, and, and acted on that anger. Some of the folks in our... <clears throat> group here today are old enough to remember the movie South Pacific. And if you remember in the movie, there's a wonderful song about, uh, about the fact that we're not born hating people. We're taught as children to hate people. And we live in a society where that's, that's still, I, I hate to say prevalent, but it's not uncommon. At least we can say that. And so how, how do we how do we effectively race at <clears throat> at eliminating this kind of, of blind anger or <clears throat> prejudice against folks who are different than us? What what how do how do we tear down these barriers that, that cause us to see something that's not real when we look at folks who are different? Well, we, we need to take a step back um, to reflect on ourselves first and explore the answer answers to these following questions. Like, am I causing any pain and suffering to others? Am I doing anything to prevent the common good or inspiring those who bully or are hateful and disrespectful in any way? And then the other question is, do I discriminate against anyone or any group of people? We need to ask ourselves these three questions. And if the answer is yes, then we need to ask ourselves, why? This big question, why? Why do I hate? Why do I look down upon people? Why do I think I'm better than somebody else or my group of people is better than the other group of people? We need to ask this big question, why? And then we need to ask ourselves that, am I unconsciously buying into stereotypes? misconception or irresponsibly reported stories from the media, internet or social media? And if so, the next question to ask ourselves is, what have I done so far to overcome this? We need to start with us first, that why do I hate and what, do, what have I done so far to overcome this. And the other thing we, we must do, because we live in a uh, diverse society and conflict you know, uh, is something you know, we, we cannot avoid. Fear of the other, we cannot avoid. So the other thing we must do is keeping the room, uh, um, to keep the door open for dialogue, open, any, open for conversation. Because if we keep the door open for dialogue, that will definitely create the environment to meet people, to hear their story, 
to hear who they are, you know, uh, about their culture, about their story. And also that will give us a chance to share ours and wants to share more stories, more of our lifestyle that will help to overcome the fear and the ignorance. And um, I would give a quick example that last year I was invited to uh, meet with one of the founder of a head group in America, one of the, well, one of the notorious head group in America. And it was supposed to be an hour long conversation. And guess what? It ended up, it ended uh, with five and a half hours conversation. And it was not, of course, respectful and um, uh, a rosy conversation. It was definitely uh, you know, a tough conversation with him. But I went ahead with a, with a peaceful heart and mind, knowing that, that I'm going to have a dialogue with this person to get to know him and, let him in, and give him an opportunity to also get to know me as well. And after this five and a half hours conversation, we hugged, we shook our hands, and I was invited for a future dialogue. Anytime I come back to Dallas from Seattle, he invited me to sit for a lunch and continue our conversation. And it was possible because we both not only shared our stories, we also made ourselves vulnerable. We, we respectfully listened to each other, even though we did not agree with everything, but at least we gave each other a time, a room for sharing our stories, having a dialogue, having a conversation. And that helped to overcome a lot of the ignorance, a lot of the myths he was holding. He, he knew it by his heart that, uh, that he shared. So ultimately, the path to debunk myths, overcome ignorance, overcome hate and violence and intolerance, we have to keep the room for dialogue open create an environment where people can share their stories in a respectful environment. It is okay to you know, disagree. It, uh, it is okay to agree to disagree as long as we respect each other and as long as we listen respectfully. I think the, the process starts from there. So that's, that's a great answer. And that's one of the reasons why so many of us appreciate the Dialogue Institute because it is facilitating exactly that solution that, that you have, uh, have identified. Uh, Race, if you finish the presentation, why don't you close that and then we'll see you better as you talk, if that's all right. Absolutely. Um... And we, had a, we have a comment from Dan who who wisely points out that one of the hurdles that we have uh, to what you have identified, learning more about each other and that kind of thing, is that we have media companies in the country that profit from stimulating the anger and the hate in the country. And so we, we, we many people get bombarded with messages that are the opposite of what we're discussing today. That's not really a question, but you may have a comment to, to the fact that, you know, we have important institutions in this country actively fomenting misunderstanding, I'm talking about some of the big media companies. <clears throat> Well, it, it is so true. And, um, you know, while our, um, some of our media constantly bombarding with um, alternative facts, untrue stories, and, um, you know, which happened to my attacker, Mark, I mean, he was not a serial killer, but he was glued to the news 24 seven and seeing the same, you know, footage again and again, and uh, listen to some of our leaders and the public officials who, inspire him to take up arms. You know, uh, that kind of situation is not over yet. Uh, right now we are so highly divided as a nation and uh, we're being bombarded constantly with, by the media that, you know, so untrue and uh, alternative facts. So we need to, again, as I said, that we need to take a step back and reflect on ourselves and ask ourselves, what is our morals? What is our values? What is our beliefs? What, you know, uh, what we truly believe, we need to ask ourselves all those questions. At the same time, 
we need to, whatever we, um, uh, we listen to and our source of information, we always, we need to verify. That is it really true instead of just um, believing them blindly? It is our responsibility, individual and collective responsibility to cross-check instead of just blindly trusting the, oh, because I, I like so-and-so anchor, whatever he says, it got to be a Bible. It got to be a, in a verse from the Quran. Instead of doing that, we need to open our source of information. Let it be a multiple source. If you watch Fox News, why don't you watch MSNBC at the same time and see what is coming from these two outlets? If you watch CNN, why don't you watch also, you know, a little bit of Fox, a little bit of MSNBC? So my point is, you know, widen up. Uh, your source of information. And if you're not sure, check with the people you truly trust that is it really true before you make any decision or taking any action, because it is you, you know, who are, who is going to be affected by this news. So why you want to put yourself in a situation where you might feel sorry or embarrassed in the future. So before you do that, we should always cross check and we should always reach out to our friends, our scholars. Don't just ask check Google, because Google is not the, not the source of all information. There are a lot of misinformation, you know, if you just, if you go to Google or to any, any uh, internet site or any search engine. So Google cannot be the mastermind. Uh, so we have to open up our source of information. And at the, at the end, ask yourself, is it really something that will bring common good? If not, then there is something wrong with that information. There is something wrong with that message because we live in a diverse society and this diversity is our strength. If somebody tries to spread a rumor or any kind of message that destroys that beauty of the diversity, that destroys our society, individual and collectively, that cannot be something, something good for ourselves and for our community and our country. We should emphasize, uh, you pointed out, Race, and Dan pointed out, it's not just the media companies, but it's our public officials that we really ought to be expecting to transmit light and understanding who, who also um, encourage misinformation. But I also want to underline something Ray she emphasized in this comment the one before you know we may not individually have the power to alter a big media corporation uh, but we have control over ourselves exactly and we are responsible for our own behavior and our own contributions and that's the place where where we should begin Well, actually, I mean, we may not have the power to change the media because we need to understand media is in a business. It's a corporation. You know, they, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a profitable company. So they always have to look for their own profit and um, they're not in our best interest. Yes, they're in the media business, but um, whatever in, you know, increase their rating, most likely they will focus on that. So while we cannot have, well, we don't have control on that, but we have control on ourselves, our thoughts and ideas, views, and our environment. So we need to focus on that, that um, because, the, you know, uh, information, information is like, uh, you know, something like food. We, we feed this to, into our mind, and then we, we react, we respond based on what we put into our system. It's like food, what we eat, you know, that's, and that's what makes who we are. So, you know, this media information is also the same thing. If we allow all this wrong information, all these fake news, alternative facts, then it is, it will be easy for us to get into that direction, always believing the conspiracy theory, always believing the negative news, and it will drive us crazy. So back to the point, whatever we see, we need to put some checks and balance. If you're not sure, check with the people that we trust, that are knowledgeable, that are scholar. If not over you know, email, maybe it could be a face-to-face -face conversation. And that's where the dialogue institute comes in place, that you can host a conversation you know, where people of all walks of life can come together. And um, let's make everyone uncomfortable with the topics they don't like to you know, uh, 
they don't like to discuss or they don't feel comfortable having, you know, having a discussion on those particular topics individually or in their own environment. But the Dialogue Institute can, Dialogue Institute can hold that kind of conversation, creating the safe environment, asking everyone to respect each other's thoughts and views, but we can have a, a, a good civic dialogue. So that's what we can do uh, you know, to take the control um, uh, you know, back to us. And uh, while we cannot fix the big medias, at least we can do these things locally, nationally, and internationally. Open up you know, room for more conversation, more dialogue, specifically on the topics that makes us uncomfortable. Okay, let, me, let, me, let me ask a very difficult question. Now, you, you, were, you were shot because of the identity that your attacker assigned to you. It wasn't your identity. It was, it was an identity that, that he assigned to you based on lots of influences. Tell me about how you see your identity today as an American. How do you see in America this process of, of developing identity, of, uh, to, to, to what extent are, are identities creating these conflicts that we're, that we're confronting? Well, I see myself first as a human being. That's my first identity like all of you, that we all are human beings. And I always try to see everyone as humans first and as an individual, not as a group. And um, my second identity would be that I am, I am an American. I chose to be an American even after being shot in the face and where I almost lost my life, but that did not change my thoughts and views and my love for this country. It was an individual, incident and the person who did that he did not represent america he did not represent anyone the whites or the christians anyone he represented himself so the problem in our society is that there's a lot of stereotype going on people tend to see people as a group that way my attacker saw me not as an individual who had nothing to do with 9 11 he saw me as you know uh, as a part of the group that he hated mostly at that time. So in America, we need to change this, in this, um, this stereotype that when, when someone you know, um, does any kind of uh, crime or anything, anything wrong, instead of blaming the entire group that he belongs to, we should see that person as an individual, we should treat that crime as an individual crime. And we should not punish the entire group or blame the entire group for that, for that individual's crime. So that we need, to, we need to change. And that is a big problem in America right now that um, whenever you know, uh, uh, a Muslim man you know, uh, get involved in any kind of terrorist act, we all Muslims immediately goes under the bus. All Muslims get blamed that Muslims are terrorists. When a black man does any, anything wrong, the entire black community is under the bus. We say, well, this is, you know, this, is a, uh, this is the problem with the black community. We try to blame the entire group, entire community. Same thing, you know, when, uh, when a police officer, you know, does anything wrong, and you know, we try to portray all the police officers are bad, defund the police, you know, um, uh, community. So we need to get beyond that kind of mentality. We need to, see crime as a crime, regardless of the victims, regardless of the perpetrator. Yes, you know, and it, it's interesting how in society, you know, the fact is most murders are committed by these white people. And yet, because they're the majority, you know, we don't identify the murderer as part of the majority. We only identify the action when it is attached to some identifiable uh, subgroup in, in the society.
Robert Kennedy was giving a speech the night when Martin Luther King was assassinated and his speech was interrupted with, and it was a speech to a primarily African-American group. And he was interrupted in the speech with the news. And so he had to respond to what was happening. And he, he pointed out in his talk that, you know, my brother was killed by a white man too. But, but in, in society, we don't, we don't give an identity to that majority. We give it to little minorities that can be, that can be uh, pushed, um, pushed aside. So how, how, tell us more about how you have worked in your own case inside yourself to respond to all that happened to you, to the complications that arose due to the racist behaviors of, of others. Because you, you, you still have to think about the, the aftermath and the health issues that you deal with, but you have overcome the, the fear, the, the, the anger and moved to another level. What, what advice do you give to the rest of us when we're in a situation, hopefully not being shot, but in some other situation where we, we need to overcome the anger well, um, after this shooting incident, uh, which almost destroyed my life and um, put me through unimaginable pain and suffering that I never imagined I would go through in my dream country, that was America. So after this incident, I remembered what my parents taught me. Before I left home at the age of 12 to attend one of the prestigious military boarding school, my, my mother told me that from now onward, you'll be staying with a bunch of kids. And remember, some of the kids may not be as friendly as you may expect. They, if they say something nasty, if they hurt you, the first thing you should do, put a zipper on your mouth. And that will not only help to deescalate the situation, it will also give you a time to respond wisely. And that was a very important lesson I learned at a very young age. So after the shooting incident, I remembered that. I controlled my tongue, deeply thought about the, the incident, what happened to me. And I went through a healing process where I grew mentally, spiritually, emotionally, and physically. So taking time actually helped me to think through the entire incident and it helped me to forgive my attacker because my mother taught me that if you are once you are hurt, never even think about taking any revenge, forgive and move on. And if you struggle to show mercy and kindness, leave it up to God and or to the justice system to take care of the matter, but you move on. Never think about of taking any revenge. That will cause more problem and you'll never be able to achieve your goals. You'll never be achieved. You'll never be able to be successful in life. It will cause more problem. So I deeply, I, I remember those lessons and I focused on rebuilding my life, took time, focused. And um, I didn't think about the shooting incident after Mark was uh, sentenced to death. I put all my energy on rebuilding my life, went to the healing process, went back to school, and also working as a waiter in a restaurant for $2.13 per hour, which total from somewhere 25 cents to a couple of bucks um, in a week. So I shifted my, put my energy to rebuilding my life, not thinking about the incident. I forgive my attacker, which helped me to get the control back to me and my happiness. And it helped me to move forward. So I would say to the audience that when you are hard, it is, you know, it is not easy uh, 
to forgive. I mean, uh, we we I mean, when we are hard, hard, the first thing you know comes into our mind is, you know, we recoil in self protection, and we we not likely too quickly respond with mercy and understanding. That is very common. That is normal. But we need to go through a process. We need to go through a healing process and think through the incident, what just happened. And if we take time, it will definitely help us to go through the process, to find some closure and respond wisely to the wrong that was done to us. Sometimes we, we try to rush, we try to respond immediately because we think if we do not respond immediately, we would look weak. We have to send the message right away. And I don't want to get into the politics. And that's what happened after 9-11. We rushed too quickly to invade Afghanistan. And we, we rushed too quickly to take revenge. And we too quickly went to the Iraq war. That's a totally different uh, discussion. But by doing that, we did not fix anything. The world has become more dangerous the war on terror is like an endless war. I'm not trying to blame anyone. I'm just, I'm just saying that when we rush, these are the consequences we would face. And that's what happens. So in personally, in collectively, everywhere, if we take time, if we, if we think through it, process it, that will definitely give us the time to respond wisely. We have a number of Texans in our group today. And I remember when John Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, that there was there there was hate in many places in America against Texans. Uh, and yet, how many Texans were involved in any way in that? And how blind was was the expression of that that hatred against Texans that occurred uh, uh, in places in America? Race, you, you dreamt of coming to the United States because of the opportunities that it, arrived, that, it, that it offered and the education that you could get here. And so you grew up with a kind of idealized vision of what, what was America. And then you come to America, you discover that, uh, that there's racism in this country, that there's lots of lots of things um, that still need to be corrected that are not a source of pride for us. And yet you are a proud American. Every one of us here is a proud American. So how do you reconcile this, the things that, that are still to be fixed in this country how do you reconcile that with the pride that you have in your identity as an American? Well, um, there, are, there are certain things if we could do that will definitely help where, you know, uh, this divisiveness, uh, the ignorance, intolerance, hate and violence we see in our society. If you could do one thing, First, if you could see and treat everyone as humans first, regardless of who they are, where they came from, if you could just do one thing, to treat everyone as humans first and respect them as you like to be respected. And if you truly believe that we all are American, we and diversity is our strength, and that is truly our strength because you know, when we Americans, we go overseas, we don't really identify ourselves. Oh, I'm a Muslim American, or I am a German American, or I'm an Irish American, I'm an African American, I'm a Hispanic American. There is no hyphenated Americans once you go overseas, we you, you know, what we use to identify ourselves. We all say we are American. Where are you from? I'm from America, or I'm from maybe Texas, or I'm from Seattle, or whatever. But we do not identify ourselves as a hyphenated American. We say we all are American. So why can't you do the same thing in our own country 
that treat everyone as Americans, no matter who you are, what is your skin color, what is your religion, where did you come from, what is your socioeconomic status? Because at the end of the day, I'm not going anywhere, I'm here. Doesn't matter how much you hate me, how much you try to kill me, I'm here. I'm as American as you are. I may look different, I may eat in a different way, I may like different food, but can you at least respect me that I am an American like you? If you could do that, that will definitely help to overcome a lot of the problems in our society. And on top of that, just see me as a human being. Don't just look at my skin color or how do I look because I have nothing to do with that. God created me in this form, in this way. And same thing with you. You did not choose to be a white or a black or a Mexican or a you know uh, X, Y, Z. So why can't you respect our humanity and each of us as humans first, if you could do that, that will definitely help a lot. And then if we, if we ask ourselves that we need to take time to get to know the other and learn or relearn that whatever I want for myself, for I want for myself and for my family is the same thing that he, he wants or they want for themselves and their families, like peace, opportunity, happiness, love. If you could believe in this, if you could at least understand that we all want the same thing for ourselves and our families and for our next generation, there will be less room for ignorance, violence, intolerance in our society. That's a great observation uh, race to sort of bring us to a conclusion. We'll turn it back to Mohammed in a minute, but you said a couple of things that that inspired me to think a little deeper. You know, one is this issue of identity, which we haven't had the opportunity, the time to get into. But if I were to think of myself as instead of being an American, as a Oki American, then my identity would start to change because I would see myself from the lens of the experience of Oki people during the death bowls in California and the challenges and so forth. And uh, um, we're, we're better off coming together in a common identity that we're, we're Americans. And when you talk about we all aspire the same things for our families. Now, I'll just conclude with this little story. I'm reminded of a number of years ago, I was in a taxi in New York City, and you know, the taxis in New York City are almost all driven by people who came from somewhere else in the world. And so this fellow, I don't remember where he was from, but could have been Bangladesh for all I know, but he was obviously by accent and by, uh, by other indicators, uh, not a native born American. And so we've chatted and indeed he was not a native born American. And, but Thanksgiving was, was coming up the, the, the coming week. And so I asked, um, uh, what, what, what is your family going to have? For, are you going to observe Thanksgiving? And the response was, of course we're going to observe Thanksgiving. What are you going to have to eat? And he looked at me as if that was an awfully odd question. Our family's going to have turkey on Thanksgiving. And so it was, it was a reminder of these things that in America are shared identities that bring us together. Uh, Muhammad, we turn the program back to you for... Um, for whatever conclusion that you'd like to provide in the Kamal. Thank you, Dr. Rendell, and thank you, Reis, for this beautiful conversation. Um, I'm so inspired by all these wonderful, um, you know, expressions and thoughts. And I think like, you know, Shannon will do the con uh, conclusion, but before that, um, I have just a quick question to Reis. Uh, Reis, can you just uh, briefly talk about your organization, the organization you lead, um, just you know, say a few words. Where do you, where where, it, where it, it is located, and um, people? How can people like you know, get connected with um, your organization, World Without Hate? Well, um, 
after Mark was executed, I did not want to stop my uh, work there. Um, and uh, during the campaign, I received tremendous amount of support and positive energy from folks all over the world. And that actually inspired me to continue my work and uh, keep my dead bed promise that I had with God, that if you let me live, I will do good things with my life. So after that, after, the, after Mark's execution, I established a nonprofit with the tremendous amount of inspiration, World Without Hate, to continue my work to inspire and uh, encourage people to be more compassionate, empathetic, understanding, accepting, and forgiving. We are based in Dallas, Texas, and also in Seattle. Our headquarter is in Seattle right now, but we operate from two locations. Dallas and Seattle. And our website is worldwithouthate.org. And our mission is to break the cycle of hate and violence through storytelling and empathy education. And we truly believe that if we work together, if we take, if we take in, um, responsibility, and uh, if we teach our younger generation to respect everyone as humans first, and uh, we also uh, check our moral compass every single day and ask ourselves what kind of world we want to live for our next generations. Is it something where they will coexist peacefully and respectfully or where they will be living in a chaos with lots of ignorance, intolerance and violence? And after asking this question, I think the answer would be always that, no, we want to build a world where there will be less violence, there will be less victims, and there will be less hate. So let's work together to build that world based upon mutual respect and dignity. And um, so, with, uh, so by keeping everything in mind, I, I um, work with my friends and my mentors and establish this nonprofit world without hate so that we can build a better world for our next generations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Trace, again. Um, Shannon, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. All right. Would you like me to wrap up? Sure, please. All right, Race, your grace, because I'm sure sharing the story again and again is must be painful. Um, I have to say I was uh, appreciative of your grace. Um, I, your mother would be very proud of you, I'm sure, because of what you are uh, doing as a legacy and a tribute to her in your kindness and your grace, um, empathy. So, uh, and I like that you pointed out that we each have that opportunity to develop. So thank you. And, uh, you know, you have so many titles, Mr. Randall, Professor, Mayor, I, I don't know anymore what to call you, but it's great to uh, see you again and have the opportunity to work with you and uh, what a great job you did moderating. Now, Muhammad, oh my goodness, you, <laughs> you are like a one man team. So I appreciate your enthusiasm. You're such a joy and Hussein. I can't see your picture anymore, uh, but uh, I know you worked with us and uh, Ray did too to be flexible because we had to keep adjusting our dates. But thank you for persevering, persevering because this was a terrific program. So many, many thanks. And I know that uh, Mohammed, being the one man team that he is, he's got lots of new things planned. Uh, but before we get to that, we started this process of these programs on restoration, reconciliation, and resiliency back in December, trying to prepare for the holidays because we knew families were fractured over the political divide. And so we wanted to provide a process for healing. And uh, um, so I'm very pleased we still have that program on the Dialogue Institute's website, if you'd like to go back and review that. We also were among the very first, if not the first, to introduce the new diversity officers. And our um, process is to 
was to get to know them personally. And that is also on the Dialogue Institute's uh, website. Now, okay, I told you, Mohammed is a one-man team. So he is, you won't want to miss this. So you want to be sure you like our page and go to our website and follow us because he is organizing a really cool interfaith concert for this summer. So now I want to introduce Hazik, and I hope you're on here. Hazik, are you there from Pakistan? <laughs> I'm not hearing Hazik. I thought I saw, I saw him earlier. So Mohammed, I'm going to have to turn it back to you to talk about the youth program really quickly. Sure. Um, so I think like, you know, um, in two weeks, we are going to uh, organize an event by the name of Leaders of Tomorrow. We invited um, students from public and private colleges to get to know one another. So we are creating a platform for our local students uh, to come and have meaningful conversation. And we're so excited that because this will, this will be a new program series for us, it's not, it's, it will be the inaugural event um, that we are hosting on April 8th. Uh, we have a wonderful speaker to inspire our next generation because we thought we always do things for the, our, you know, things for our generation, but the next generation also worth to um, work with. And um, from now on, we will have many events um, for the next generation uh, under the um, under the name of Leaders of Tomorrow, um, you know, Leadership Academy. So um, with with that being said, I like to thank each and every single one of you for making the time available to join us tonight. We so appreciate your support and uh, hoping to see you with us next time. Thank you, everybody. And please, as, as Shannon mentioned, follow our Facebook page um, to be updated about upcoming events. Thank you, uh, Dr. Randall. Thank you, Reis. Thank you, Hussein, for this wonderful event. And especially, th and especially we want to thank Shannon for her leadership and making this all happen. Absolutely. Definitely. Yes, Shannon. It's so easy when you work with Muhammad. <laughs> but thank you. And thank you again for everything, Ray. So I, I could talk to you for hours. What an inspiration. And everyone who is participating, wow, you gotta, you gotta love, you know, you give me inspiration. So indeed. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you and good night. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.